When I was about eight years old, we were on vacation with my family in the mountains. And we were coming home from dinner late one night, and it was this beautiful, starry sky above us. And my dad stopped us to show us some constellations. And it was, it was cold, it was raining, <laughs> but he was so excited. And so we didn't whine too much as he started explaining about, uh, this is the Great Wagon, and then he showed us the Cassiopeia, which is this W-shaped star constellation that many of you have probably already seen because it's really easy to spot. And just below the Cassiopeia, there's this tiny smudge of light. And I saw that tiny smudge, and it wasn't moving, and so, I thought, what, what is that? It's not a star. It's not a planet. And had I had a telescope with me up on that mountaintop, this is what I would have seen. We didn't have a telescope, like I said, so we, I relied on my dad to explain that this is actually the Andromeda galaxy, the only other major galaxy that you can see with your bare eye in the night sky. And I thought, oh, that's really... So it's a pretty picture. The, wait, the eight-year-old me went, whoa, 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 wait, other galaxy? What do you mean, other galaxy? Because I was eight, so I knew that we live on a round, roundish planet called Earth, and that there are other planets in our solar system that, to our knowledge, don't have life on them. We don't know for sure, but we think they don't. And I knew that our solar system is somewhere centered on the outer skirts of the Milky Way, but for some reason, I had never realized that we have more than one galaxy in our universe, and they are really, really, really far away. So that was a huge, sudden, drastic expansion of an eight-year-old's universe right there. And with that expansion came all these questions. More stars, more planets are in those galaxies right now. And we don't know what's there because they're 2.3 million light years away, so the light we're seeing is already 2.3 million years old. So we don't even know. There could be other life out there right now having TEDx conferences in other galaxies. I don't know. And I'm, I'm 34 now, and I still don't know, but and I've practiced this part of my talk so many times, and it gets me really, really excited, and I get goosebumps every single time because all these questions are so existential and at the core of our existence. Who else is out there? Why are we even here? And as the years went by and I grew older, that fascination for space that was laid, that foundation was laid in that moment. That turned into when somebody asked me and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say, I want to be an astronaut. And I would like to know, I can see all the way to the back, so I would like to know who else here today wanted to be an astronaut when they were a little kid or wants to be one today. Oh. So it looks to me as though it's all of your hands. <laughs> that's quite a few, and I know some of you, so that's cool. <laughs> well, a lot of us humans share that, that, yeah, that, that passion and that drive to go into space, and the first person to do so was Yuri Gagarin in 1961. And a lot has changed since those 50, almost 60 years. We have our news in color now. That's really cool. But still, only about 550 people have flown into space, and that's about the size of the audience here today, which is perfect. And I'm trying to look. So I would say walking in, I registered, it's about, I would say, 40% female audience. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. So it's about, a, we have 40% females in the audience here, but of the 550 people who've gone to space, only 65 of them have been women a few of them European, and none of them German. And that bothered a lady called Claudia Kessler, who decided to rock the boat of the all-male German astronaut corps by starting her own independent astronaut selection program last year to find the first female German astronaut. And over 400 highly qualified women applied, and a rigorous and extensive selection procedure whittled them down from 400 to 120 to 90 to 30 to 8 to 6 to 2. And my colleague Nicola Baumann and I will begin training next week, actually, or in two weeks. <laughs> and I'm really, really excited about this. And one of us will hopefully fly to the International Space Station in 2020. 
And while I'm really, really excited at the chance of flying into space and seeing the Earth from above, of watching a sunrise every 90 minutes, of seeing the blues and the greens and the clouds and the thin, frail atmosphere, the eight-year-old girl inside of me is a bit surprised at the fact that it's 2017 and I can still be the first German female in space. And why is that? Why have we not had a German female astronaut? And part of that is because human spaceflight, while undoubtedly scientifically valuable, and in my opinion, culturally indispensable, is really expensive. And so it's good that not all of you raise your hand because we, don't, we can't pay all of you to go up there. And another reason is that to become an astronaut, you need a background in a certain area, and that's math, IT, natural sciences, technology, engineering, what we call in Germany the MINT fields, or in the US the STEM fields, and those are all areas where we have an underrepresentation of women, and we have an underrepresentation of teenage girls and of little girls. And that is what I want to talk about a little bit today. Why do these girls go missing? That's what they're called in Germany, missing MINT girls. And some people have spent some time on that and developed programs because they found that these girls, while they are interested when they're younger, they lose confidence in themselves in these areas as they grow older. So it's, you, you start empowering these girls and say, yes, you can, you can do it. But I think it's not just a question, the girl is maybe not just asking the question, can I do it? I think she's maybe asking a much deeper question, should I even be doing this? And because I have two daughters, they're four and they're six, and when we redecorated our rooms, their rooms, they were in the space phase, they were really interested for rockets, drawing them, building them, starting launching them in our backyard, and we wanted to get some astronaut wall tattoos for their walls. And we sat down at the computer and we found this. So they didn't really like that selection, and now we have a Disney princess on the wall, which is fine too, but you know, not really what we wanted. And my daughter started to read, and I thought, oh, cool, I can get her one of these beginner's books, you know, and um, I'll find one on space. And I found one on space, which is cool, because there's a rocket, and there's lots of other adventurous stuff going on in that book, but it says, super strong stories for boys. Hmm. I can buy the book. She'll think I'm nuts because she's a girl. So luckily, the author also wrote a book for girls. And look, it's fantastic, dainty little stories, with fairy, fairy, it's lots of fairy dust and horses, and I read inside that there's pirates, but they want to be really nice pirates. It's not really adventurous. And so we have, on the one side, we have the super strong stories about the adventures for boys, and on the other side, we have the stories for the girls. And trust me when I say I spent about three seconds on Google finding these examples, and there's many, 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 many more, but I don't have enough time. <laughs> so, and what does this say to a girl that is interested in the other side? What does it say to a boy who's interested in the other side? We can talk about that too, but I'm going to focus on the missing mint girls. Where are they and why are they leaving? And what can we do to change that? And because I think it's not enough to tell the girls, oh, you can do it. Just believe in yourself, you can do it. It's not enough. Because when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which the flower grows. You don't fix the flower. And how can we fix it? How can we fix this environment? What can we do? And I think, what we can do is we can have, yeah, have a little bit of focus on our own words and our own actions. And the reason why I think that is, this is the 11-year-old me. <laughs> um, we were on vacation in France, again on vacation, <laughs> always on vacation, and we wanted to light a fire. And another dad called out to us and said, kids, come on, come over here, we'll start the fire over here. And we all ran up to him. And he looks at me and says, oh, not you, girls don't light a fire. And this came from a very, very nice, gentle, good-natured man who has no idea, he does not remember that he said that to me. But I remembered that moment when I was sitting in front of the fireplace of our new home two years ago, wondering why it felt so uncomfortable for me to sit there with a match trying to light a fire. I was really shocked because I'm 32 and I'm, or I was 32 and I'm really confident, but I was feeling weird in front of that fireplace. And my daughter brought home this true or false questionnaire where in the third, third row from the bottom, it says, I like math, and she crossed false. How dare she in my house? <laughs> as long as you put your feet under my table, you like math. And she was sleeping at the time when I found this, and so I, my instinct was to run up to her and be like, what is going on here? But you never wake a sleeping baby. And so I waited till she opened her eyes 
the next morning, and I casually moved over and said, okay, so what's up here? Why don't you like math? And she said, you know, I'm not good at it. I was like, what? She's in first grade. She adds, she subtracts, she sells the sandcakes at a profit, she divides a bag of gummy bears equally among a family of four. Why does the kid think she can't do math? And so I waited a little bit, because I may seem eager here, but I try to be more relaxed at home. But it didn't go away. And a couple of weeks later, I talked to the teacher, and I said, listen, I, I don't know what's going on, and I don't know how to fix it, because I love math. I, I do math with her all the time, and I, I, but I can't tell her, I love math, now you do too. It doesn't work like that. What, what, what do I do? And the teacher said, you know, it's really weird. All the, girls, all the girls in class, and at 16, they're sitting there saying, oh, we can't do math, and she doesn't know either. I, we don't know where it's coming from. And she's working on it, but it takes a lot of work. Why, why is that there? And I think, I wonder why it's there in a culture where it's kind of coy and cute to say, oh, she's a girl, she doesn't need to know how to do math, let's let, let the men do the taxes, let the men pay the bills. We'll design a shirt that says, in math, I'm just decor. <laughs> and that shirt, you're laughing, it's sold out. It's sold out. It's, it's actually sad. And if I think about it too long, I'll start crying. And we don't want that, so I'll move on. And so it's not just our words, it's also our actions. I read a study again, they make me very upset, these studies, that in German households, and this holds true for inter globally, unfortunately, girls spend more time doing chores than boys because boys mow the lawn with dad and girls do the dishes and the laundry with mom. And these are the more time-consuming tasks. So there, we're setting them up for the pattern that we're trying to change. There's so much discussion on how do we get women to stay in the workforce and we need the men to do more, but we're passing on a completely different message to our girls and uh, sons and daughters. And then what, we're, what else we're passing along with that is we're giving them a wage gap to go along with it. Because another study found that eight-year-old boys get 20% more allowance than eight-year-old girls. That is messed up. That is really messed up. And so, initially, when I read these studies, I, of course, immediately did an assessment of our own household. I felt really good because I do the shopping and the cooking, but my husband vacuums and does the laundry, thus proving you don't need a second X chromosome to turn on a washing machine. And you can imagine the look on my admittedly somewhat smug face when I realized I have never mown a lawn in my life. And it really needs mowing because this is what it looked like yesterday morning. I can't tell you why I haven't, but I have no ambitions to do so. And that is a problem because with our actions, with what we do and with we, what we don't do, we are subconsciously passing on the message that moms don't mow the lawn. And I asked all of my mom friends, I said, listen, you guys mow the lawn? No, we don't. And part of the reason why we don't mow the lawn is, and don't watch on our words and don't pay attention to our actions is because it can be uncomfortable to do so. Every single time I talk about this, and now, I, because I wear the blue polo, I get asked about this a lot, is, what can we do? And I talk about these questions and how it's sometimes you have these sexist remarks going on or these little jokes or the cute comments about how girls can't do math. And it, it makes people uncomfortable. It really makes people uncomfortable because that means that you're, you're sort of pointing a finger and nobody wants to be the annoying gender watchdog. I don't want to be the annoying gender watchdog. I also don't really want feel like mowing or lawn. And because I'm already flying into space, isn't that enough? I don't want to mow or lawn too. My husband can just do that. But I think it's really important that we all look at what we say and what we do, because with the future we're heading to, we cannot afford to have things stay the same as they are right now. We can't afford to have our kids growing up in a world where they're slamming into gender stereotypical books, bookshelves and elementary school wage gaps. That's not possible. It's not acceptable. I don't want that. <laughs> and I don't think either you do, uh, neither do you. And so initially, this is where I wanted to end my talk, but then I decided that I'm being ridiculous. And so yesterday, for the first time in my life, I'm proud to say that I mowed or lawn, part of it at least,
because then I went inside to practice my talk for today. And I even had a little helper who came outside because she saw me outside, so she came outside too and helped. And I'm fully aware that this was not one of those Andromeda Galaxy moments for her. Most likely it was not. <laughs> but at least my husband sends thanks to TEDx Hamburg because now I'm the one. <laughs> and what I want to end with now is I think that if all of us here just take a little time to think on our words and our actions, we can all, contrib we can all contribute to getting more women into space and hopefully beyond one small step at a time. Thank you.